Hello, everyone. My name is Lucian. Most of you know me from Twitter as Triangle Investor. In today's edition of CEO and Market Expert Interviews, I'm glad to host Joe Kelly. Joe is the Chief Executive Officer for Uranium Markets uh, LLC, a full-service nuclear fuels brokerage company. Joe, welcome uh, for the first time in my show. It is great to have you. Well, thank you for having me on. I do appreciate it. What a what an honor after the many guests that uh, you had interviewed wonderfully in the past uh, to invite me on. I, I'm, I'm honored. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Joe, you are not an exception. Every guest that comes to my show for the first time has to tell uh, about himself. Uh, what's your background? Who is Joe Kelly? How did you end up in Uranium? Tell us more. Well, I'm happy to speak of that. Uh, uh, I had spent uh, 25 years starting right after college uh, in a more traditional Wall Street function. I was in uh, government bonds and I worked in Japan uh, for two years. I worked in London for eight years. And uh, and now here I am in Greenwich, Connecticut uh, after a long Wall Street career. I ended up to 25 years. And then 15 years ago, I found myself in the uh, in the uranium market, uh, the very volatile 2007, 2008 period when we reached one hundred and thirty six dollars a pound. Uh, there was a uh, the market seemed to have, was looking for some sort of transparency and liquidity. And since I had a history of running brokerage firms, uh, I, I knew how to uh, apply a basic OTC brokerage model uh, to the industry, and uh, and I presented it, and it seemed the industry uh, accepted the uh, the premise of of uh, just creating bid offer spreads and have an in intermediary seek out offers when people are looking for uh, uh, for supply and seek out bids when looking for place supply. So uh, it, it worked out fine for the industry. Uh, I've uh, I, I'm here in uh, in Greenwich, Connecticut. I grew up in Queens, New York, and uh, I, I just uh, just certainly enjoy being in markets. It makes for a very big, exciting world. Our nuclear industry is a lot of fun because we get to uh, have conferences all over the planet and meet yeah. some really great people. And I'm very happy to be part of this industry. Excellent background. Uh, Joe, tell me more about your company, Uranium Markets LLC. What do you guys do over there? Well, the interesting uh, role, I've noticed most of the folks that you've had on this uh, program before uh, were all people who are uh, uh, kind of long uranium. So yeah. what we are is we're an intermediary. What we do is we match buyers and sellers up. So we, uh, as I mentioned briefly uh, just before, is uh, when people come to us and they have a bid uh, and uh, uh, we then go seek out offers and then uh, it sort of builds on itself. It's a communal a form of transparency and liquidity uh, that we call all over the world to everyone who can possibly sell uranium globally. We have a connection with them or anyone who could possibly buy uranium globally. Uh, we have a relationship with them uh, and uh, with the utilities, with miners, with traders, with investors. And mm -hmm. uh, and we just keep in touch with them all day long. We have a team of Alexandra Penny Paskey. We have Ross Corbett and we have uh, Joe Kelly Jr. Uh, Kelly DeLuca is, uh, runs our operations for us. And it, it's just a great team that just reaches out globally. We take no positions. We're not long. We're not short. We never long and short as a company. We decided some years ago where if we're going to broker or we're, it goes as introduction brokers to the marketplace, we're not going to try to have it go up or try to have it go down or be, uh, be at all wanting that to happen. So we basically just bring buyers and sellers together at a fair price. Early on, some folks said, Joe, we, some, some, some say people on the production side said, Joe, we'd like to deal with you but we'd like you to give us some really good expensive sales. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, that's not the business we're in. We're in the business of fair deals. And same thing with the utilities early on. They said to us, if you can get us some cheap uranium, then we'd love to deal with you. We don't live in that world. We live in the world where equilibrium comes together. And when we have the equilibrium on price, for example, right now we have a buyer at $91.50 uh, for immediate delivered uranium. We have a seller at $93. So we're trying to negotiate that uh, that the, the selling interest and the buying interest somewhere at a at a place where both parties can be satisfied. The fun thing about that is once we uh, negotiate the deal, then uh, uh, then we disseminate the deal price. So that's a real price point for people to understand what the price is. Because in an illiquid, opaque market, uh, any sort of light of information is very helpful. So as soon as we do that deal, say hypothetically, we deal at $92. I'm not saying we're dealing at $92. Okay, okay. I'm just yeah. saying hypothetically, then we'd right away tell the entire world that buys and sells uranium that $92 has just traded. 
So that, that's the role we play. We do that in U308. We do that in conversion. We do that in uh, SWU and EUP. It's more of our bread and butter is a U308 at the uh, the spot or uh, short-term market. Uh, but we do all sorts of deals as well. We did a, a relatively large SWU deal uh, just recently for a utility that asked us to go out and 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 bring up line up a bunch of offers for them, and, and we did that and were able to uh, were able to secure that 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 SWU for that U.S. utility and uh, and get them what they were looking for. And both parties were were both unhappy and happy, and that's kind of where we want to be. Okay, got it. Uh, but is your company also investing in uranium equities, for example? Uh, no, sir. We don't, we're not bulls. We're not bears. Uh, we don't want the market uh, to go up or go down. When we speak to our utility clients as of late, uh, we try to share their pain. Uh, we say, boy, things are terrible out there right now. Uh, uh, the prices are just going through the roof. And then if our next call is with our producers' friends, and uh, and we congratulate them and talk about the euphoria that they're experiencing. So we don't care whether the price goes up or down. We're the guy in the middle that can give the honest view of the marketplace without a bias. So we don't invest in equities as a policy of our company. We don't invest in the physical. Uh, we can invest in other sectors. But if you're an employee of uranium markets, uh, we do not buy or sell uh, uranium equities or anything to do with our sector. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what are the biggest challenges in that process you do uh, in your business? What is the biggest challenges you encounter? Well, one of the big challenges is the fact that since there are not a lot of participants in the uranium markets, it's a very thinly traded market. Yes. You tend to have everyone buying all at the same time or selling mm -hmm. all at the same time. So that's kind of hard to do. If everyone's a seller, how do you get a buyer? So that makes yeah. it kind of complicated and hard. So what we have to do is we have to use uh, our abilities to extract uh, pricing uh, in a downward trending market. We have to find a, a potential buyer. So we have to analyze their needs. We have to help them make decisions based on the fact that the market could go up again. So we have to have those discussions and make sure they're comfortable with an acquisition, making sure that we're okay to, uh, to help the needs of the uh, supply that needs to find a home. Same thing the other way, when the market price is going up, uh, we and nobody wants to sell. We have to somehow secure somebody and convince them that there's a price that they should sell for various reasons. If they're long, say, a million pounds, uh, uh, speculatively, and we have, uh, say, utilities looking to buy, well, we say, you know, the markets don't go in one direction. They usually go up and they go down. And and maybe you want to take 100,000 of those million pounds and maybe sell it at, may say, $92, sticking with the same example we had before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then if it goes back down to 86 or $85, and in the short term, well, maybe they can buy it back. So we have these conversations regularly with our clients to help them grow comfortable uh, with uh, uh, with market movement and hedging long positions or covering some shorts that need to be uh, uh, covered by the utilities. So these are co constant conversations we have with our clients. Okay. Uh, 2023 is behind us. We have witnessed sharp rise in spot price from uh, high 40s to low 90s at the moment, uh, almost a double. But uh, not just the spot. We have a conversion price at new record highs. Uh, SWU is approaching record highs. Joe, please, your comment on 2023 and what can we expect uh, from 2024, 2024? Well, it's hard to turn a bull when it's raging. And right now we have a raging bull market. And, uh, uh, and uh, that well, that's reflected in the current price. Now, we like to tell everyone, we know that those that are long, are interested in having the price go even higher. Well, $92, just our example, in between our bid offer spread of $91.50 and $93, well, that's pretty high uh, compared to the past. So is it truly reflected in the price presently, the, the, the extent of the bull market, or is there still more upward movement to go? Well, basically, that'll be determined by buyers uh, uh, coming into the market and, and drying up supply. And supply has been thinner than it has been for a long time, as far as uh, as far as we see here. So, but that also is a reflection of ninety-two dollar uranium. Uh, of course, at ninety-two dollars, of course, supply is thin. We found out the same thing just recently uh, today. We we had a few clients who had uh, inquired about uh, conversion, and we were unable to secure a, an offer from anybody who'd want to sell conversion. Now, conversion, just going back a few years, was trading at two or three dollars in the form of UF six. They yeah. sometimes discounted it so much just to move the UF6 because of the oversupply we had years ago that there was very little value often attributed to conversion. In this case here, conversion has now gone from two, three, four, five dollars 
up to a, a $45, $46, $47. So if you were loan conversion or had access to conversion, a $46 price is very exciting to sell. So it's it's unlikely that anyone is still holding uncommitted or unused or, or useless or conversion that they don't need uh, because most have already gotten rid of it. So now we find there's need for conversion. So we have to go to a next tier seller and somehow find out where they are. So we had to remove any, I guess sometimes we put bids and offers out there that we think people would sell uh, because of information or conversations we've had with them. In this case here, we couldn't nail down a, a consistent or a reliable seller of conversion. So we had to move the offer back uh, considerably in order to uh, find at least somebody who's willing to sell. We moved it back from a uh, from a high 40s offer to a high 50s offer uh, just today because we felt an obligation to help our clients who are actually looking to secure some conversion. So the the uh, it seems like that price is certainly in the in the near term gone up. But once again, we're in the world of equilibrium where we have buyers at high 40s, sellers at at high 50s. Somewhere in the middle lies the truth. I don't know how close to the low side or how close to the high side it is. But that's where we are. So speculation on where price is going is not what we do. We tell you where the real price is at this point, where supply is, where demand is. And what we really can tell you is maybe we could give you a little advice on where it might trade in the U308 side, where it might trade between $91.50 and $93. But other than that, that's the range we see right now. Because if someone was incredibly bullish, and they think that $92 is very cheap for uranium, well, they should be buying it. You got that right. Uh, as active player on the uranium market, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm hearing that it's very, very hard to secure a short-term delivery, let's say 30-day, 60-day delivery. And I'm not talking big volumes. Is that really the case, Joe? Tell us. Well, no, it's not hard. We have a $93 offer. But the point is, does somebody want to pay $93? <laughs> That's the question. So yeah, but the volume. So also the volumes, it's it's impossible to secure a big a big amount of uranium on spot price, right? I don't have anyone who's looking to pay $93 for 100,000 pounds, nor do I have somebody looking to pay $93 a pound for a million pounds. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line is the price reflects the scarcity of the commodity just like in any other commodity. So right now the price is rising. If somebody tried or is trying to buy a million pounds at $93, it'll either be met with that supply or the price might click up another couple of dollars based on that. But I don't see demand at $93 at this point where we have supply. So therefore the market is truly reflected between $91.50 and $93. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what about long-term contracts? Uh, what are you hearing, or better to say, what is your opinion in the terms of pricing uh, of the term contracts, which details are not disclosed, uh, especially the one with ceilings and floors? What price levels are we seeing, Joe, at the moment, at the recent uh, contract? Well, I have no uh, proprietary information other than what you've received as well. They are negotiating deals. Deals are getting done. Uh, we're hearing that caps are in the triple digits. Uh, floors are also uh, yeah. uh, to protect the, the cost of production. So the, there is, uh, right now it's a seller's market, so the sellers can dictate terms where in the past, for many years, for most of the years, it was a buyer's market, right. and the buyers dictate terms. So in, in this instance, uh, are the caps higher than they have been in the past? Yes. One thing I'm hearing pretty consistently is, is that they're basing uh, their uh, the prices of their, their long-term deals off of spot. Uh, they don't necessarily feel that the long-term price, which is a, a, a number that, well, for me, math, things have to make mathematical sense. The long-term price is sort of a number that's pulled out of the air and pulled down. Uh, they can substantiate it and argue it a lot of other ways. I can only base uh, uh, prices off of a uh, demand and supply. I don't see, because everyone who comes into the market is new. In this case, I think the long-term price is in the high 60s. Uh, someone's saying that uh, uh, that uh, uh, the, could, the new people come into the market and say, can I buy long-term uranium in the mid-60s yeah. or high 60s and sell it at $91 or $91.50? Well, of course we can't do that. So there's, there's no basis to that number. So in a marketplace that's driven or a seller's market, you're going to find that the sellers will dictate what true real value is. In this case here, spot market basing your escalation off of the spot valuation is probably the future because that's real. So what, what's going to happen here is you're going to find more... Um, 
people who sign contracts, who, who put long-term contracts together, they're going to need to make sure that the spot price is, is, is legitimate. It actually has sellers and buyers to find equilibrium to truly price it. If you have a lot of long-term contracts that are based off of spot and you don't have the interest of the consumer, the utility, creating supply in the, uh, in the spot market in order to keep it in check, then sometimes you'll have an inflated valuation based on the fact that only the producers and the traders are able to actually participate in the spot market. Yeah. So legitimizing the spark market by, by greater volume and greater participants, it, it, for me, it's self-serving because that's the world I live in. But it's also, I believe, the future of the market, which is why we're, we're optimistic. And we do nothing else other than uh, uranium markets. Well, you know that by the name, but we do nothing else other than broker uh, uranium and uh, the fuel cycle. Okay, well, uranium 100%. That's great to hear. Uh, Joe, if we look at the new uranium supply gap charts, and they were made before uh, countries launched a declaration to triple nuclear energy capacity by 2050, those charts show a massive gap with around uh, 700,000 uh, metric tons of uranium by 2040. Are you in line with those numbers or you are seeing them as a bit, uh, ex uh, maybe, maybe they are ex exaggerated? Well, that's, that's a great question. And from our seat, which is quite unique, uh, uh, is that we hear a lot of information. We hear that there's plenty of supply. We hear there's plenty of demand. We hear there's more demand than there's supply, more yeah. supply than there's demand. So we have to absorb all that information and reflect it in a price. Well, of course, if there's limited supply, price would be at a higher level, which it is right now. So you're talking now uh, increasing consumption, increasing a nuclear power, increasing re reactors and utilities. Well, that's a great, it's an interesting function because to in, build a nuclear power plant, it takes a long time. It takes a lot of money. And the commitment seems to be there. And I'm very happy about that. And the industry is very optimistic that there will be commitment in the growth of nuclear power uh, due to well, saving the planet, no carbon emissions. It's all good. Uh, but also there's plenty of uranium. Uh, there's a, uh, it, it's, uranium is more abundant, 500 times more abundant than gold. Uh, it's not mm -hmm. quite as abundant as uh, iron ore, but somewhere in between lies uranium. So there are a lot of opportunities for these uh, uh, these new these junior mines, these these uh, prospective mines who have uh, calculated their pounds in the ground at a certain cost. Uh, now certainly can now put a calculation together where production will cost them X, and they can come online and start feeding into the demand. And with the higher price points, that makes it easy for them to make an economic decision to bring on supply. So supply became restricted only to a few producers for some time due to the lower prices. With the lower prices, people were not given the proper incentive to start producing uranium. It, you can more quickly produce uranium from a newer mine uh, than you can build a nuclear power plant creating more demand. So you will find that the uh, mines coming online will be able to meet some of the demand. And the issue here is now how quickly they all come online. Uh, they're not organizing coming online. They're obviously looking at each thing as their own individual commercial venture. So if it makes sense for them to take risk and move their operations forward, they will. They're not working together. And they're not con colluding on, uh, on production. So there, if more than needed comes online, then it'll slow uh, the rising price. If less than needed come online, then it will not. So it's just purely supply and demand based on a, my concern is, is that as the, well, not my concern, the opportunity is as price grows higher, the, uh, the commercial uh, uh, opportunity for these mining companies are greater. So therefore they will come on more quickly and uh, uh, building out the power plants will take some time. Creating that new demand will take some time. So it's an issue of how long it takes for the new demand versus the supply. Yeah, agreed. And uh, that was part of my next question. Uh, how do you see mine restarts dynamic going forward? Uh, I mean, Joe, what is the incentive price of uranium today when we factor all the inflation, uh, labor issues, etc.? What is the incentive price of uranium for developers to step in? Today. Well, that, that, then that, that's a great question to summoning in the mining business. And uh, uh, basically, we speak to all the miners. They're a happy bunch right now. So they're, they're, they like the way things are going. Uh, but those numbers, I'm assuming, not being an expert in the mining field, 
that that is all based on a, an individual costs and different regional uh, locations course, and shipping. And there's a lot of things that certainly go into Factors. that. That's certainly not a question for an intermediary broker, which is the role I perform. Uh, no, but I, I, I mean, but you're hearing stuff. You you talk I'm hearing lots of you, stuff. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You talk with the utilities. You talk with people, with brokers, traders. You know all. Let's say all the process, and you are hearing also that part of the equ equation. So. That's the reason why I asked you that. Well, no, it's a good question because there's a lot of things you hear because some are claiming that their production costs will be higher than they originally stated uh, because uh, well, maybe they were trying to uh, uh, persuade their investor community, the capital markets, to put more money into their, uh, their operation. So they might have underestimated the cost of production. Uh, and now that prices are rising, that they can now truly express or maybe even overexpress the cost of their production in order to justify their uh, uh, their sales into the marketplace. So there's a lot of angles, uh, not saying anyone does any of those things I just listed, but there are possibilities and opportunities for uh, for information that come for us to interpret whether it's a, uh, whether it's going to be something that's bearish or bullish. Okay. Uh, Joe, let's move to China. Uh, how do you see- No, please. I like Greenwich, Connecticut. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How do you see them positioning in the future as a country that is currently building 25 reactors, more than 40 planned and more than 150 proposed? How do you see them positioning in the future? Well, I guess with their uh, pollution problem, their need to uh, uh, reduce their carbon emissions, their need to clean up the air, uh, and their industrial nature, uh, they're, they're going to have to go to a form of a, a power that is not going to pollute the air. What are they, 60% coal at this point? Some number yeah. like that, which is, a, uh, which is outrageous. But uh, so I have not been to mainland China. I've been to Hong Kong a couple of times with, back in the day. But I do say, though, that uh, those that go there talk about how here in, uh, in Greenwich, Connecticut, we have what the temperature is going to be. And sometimes during the summertime, they talk about the humidity. When you're in China, in mainland China, you talk about three things, not two things, temperature, humidity, and pollution level. And yeah. that's not sustainable to citizens, and, that, and that's not fair to the citizens there. So are they going to be robust in, in building out? Of course, until another form of, uh, of energy comes in that's, that's equal to or greater than uh, nuclear power, uh, then they are going to robustly build out power plants and, uh, and uh, nuclear power plants, and they're going to continue that plan. So they're actively entering the marketplace, both on the uh, uh, capital investments in uh, mining operations. Uh, they've got uh, significant inventories. Uh, they we've heard they even have a we've heard they even have uh, an abundance of, of SWU EUP they're selling into the open market. So, yeah. uh, so they they will be a, a factor and continue to do so because they need to. But do you believe that they will rely on their? known sources of uranium uh, with majority coming from Kazakhstan? Or do you believe that they will be more aggressive to secure material from other sources, uh, Africa, Mongolia, Australia? Well, I would, I would say the latter. I mean, they're going to be intelligent about how they consume. Uh, there was a point back some years ago when China entered the market, the open market, contacting us and, and many others, and secured just, just large quantities of uranium and just took it and, and, and had delivery and had, had it uh, stored uh, domestically. So they, they, they're they not going to be um, targeted on their lack of supply. They're going to diversify. They're, they're going to approach right. it in a very intelligent way. They Certainly, they're going to approach it the way I would. And it wouldn't be just counting on one producer. It would be multiple producers in many different areas of the world. Yeah, I agree on that. Uh, Joe, how do you see the future of Sput? Uh, they have cleaned up overhanging supply in the last two years, now holding more than 43 million uh, pounds of uranium, yellow cake. How do you see their format in the future? I think it's 63 million, if I if I, if I I read the uh, website. Yes, though. I said 63.2. Oh, sorry, I think you said 43, yep. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 63. Well, that's that's nearly a half of year's consumption uh, yeah. of uh, of uranium, which it, it's a lot. Uh, it was a lot of cheap material, and it was a great identification of uh, of inexpensive material to help the uh, economics and the robust production come on. Uh, is the investor willing to continue to hold a long uranium position? Historically, we struggled with UPC, used to be the uh, closed end fund, uh, aka ETF. 
uh, yeah. that many people would find their way into investing into the uh, uranium sector. It was much smaller than Sput. And oftentimes when it became no longer trendy or a bear market or less of a bull market in, uh, in, uh, in uranium, then UPC would then trade at a considerable discount. And, and it didn't act as a functional ETF because the interest in the investor would sometimes disappear, sometimes come back. So yeah. sometimes they'd come back in, the market would go up, they traded a premium, they then uh, very awkwardly raise money, uh, buy some more uranium, put it into the fund. And they also would sell uranium occasionally when it was at a discount uh, in order to try to bring the net asset value closer to the share value. So now here we have Spud. It's a Goliath. Uh, it, it's organized and structured in a much better way than UPC. The, uh, uh, the investor community is much more informed uh, yes, on how to agreed. stay long, how to invest in, in uranium. So it's become a, a vehicle. Now, what's the, what's the limit or what's the uh, uh, the uh, the most that an ETF should be holding uh, of the consumption of any commodity? Well, that's the interesting question. I don't have the answer to that, uh, but we'll certainly find out. I can, I'm concerned that uh, that they're not willing, or at least some of the information I received, uh, that the SPUD is not willing to sell uranium, even if they go to a more significant discount. Since they've been open, they've been more over 20%, a few times over a 20% discount to net asset value. And what, what a normal ETF or a more mature ETF, I should say, not normal, more mature ETF, would then try to uh, satisfy the shareholders by selling some of the underlying, uh, in this case, uranium, and then buying back the shares to narrow the net asset value of Delta. So what, what I don't know how that's going to work when we exit or leave a bull market. Is the world going to be interested in holding 63 million pounds of uranium where in the past they were not? Uh, and uh, uh, will it be hard for the uh, sport to uh, to uh, split shareholders if we end this bull market? Not saying we are, of course. I, 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 it seems very bullish. Well, it's 90, 90, almost ninety-two dollars a pound. So of course, that's bullish. But uh, if the bullishness of the market uh, wanes and uh, and even reverses into a bear market, will the investors want to exit uranium and get into something else, or are they happy to hold uranium on a long-term basis? So it's a very interesting study on an ETF. The quantity that's in there, uh, it's interesting if it's the right quantity and before it was the wrong quantity, or is it the wrong quantity now, or is it somewhere in between? Very good question. Yeah, what about the other players, the, 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 the buyers of physical uranium that, that have arrived on the market and some are still arriving? Do you see that as a factor that will lift the price of uranium even more? Well, the buyers have bought. It was it was determined. We were at twenty something dollars a pound for a very long time. We trade up to twenty eight, moved down to twenty four. So we were sitting there and, and kind of finding uh, a, a degree of comfort at uh, at the mid twenties, uh, high twenties, and that was certainly not a good level. At one point, some years ago, Chemico came in and decided to increase their inventory holdings. So they came to the spot market and they consumed a large quantity of uranium, not enough to take the overhanging supply off the market, uh, but they bought a lot of uranium, drove it up a little bit, maybe to the low 30s, uh, but still did not bring it up to the levels that it's at today. So with Sput now creating the opportunity to take over the overhanging material, uh, as, as the market uh, now trades up on the back of that, how far can it go based on, on, on the material disappearing from the market? So the new buyers, and along the way, when we're in the 20s, 30s, even 40s, there was a lot of funds that did their homework and realized that, in their view, production might not be able to meet demand going forward. So they felt that going long uranium was a good investment. Many of those funds have, have done very well. Uh, if they come in and buy now, will they do well? Well, if we go to $200 a pound, where we, we did at one point go to $136 a pound back in 2007, we are uh, uh, using a calculation for present value of money incorporating inflation. Well, that's about $207 a pound. So we're not quite, we're, we're, we're getting closer to the old numerical high, but not the current true value high. So true value high has is over $200 a pound. Oh, so yeah. is there a lot of up to go? Yeah. And those investors that came in early, uh, did they do well? Yes, they've done well. Are they holding their position? Yes. But the flip side of that is that we have more sellers than we ever have before, because those people who are sitting on or bought physical uranium, well, they can't use it for anything other than giving it back to the fuel cycle in order for the nuclear power plants to eventually buy it and burn it. So, so bottom line is we have that cheap material was purchased by, well, Sport and a bunch of investors that you asked about, 
But okay. those now investors that are sitting on the uranium, they're also become sellers. So they will also sell to the uh, market at one point. They can't use it for anything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Joe, you were uh, at the last bull market also in 20, uh, in 20, uh, 2007. Uh, can you draw some parallels with that bull market and this one? What are the main differences? Is there any similarities? Tell me more. I'll give you, I'll give you the main differences first. The marketplace wasn't as commoditized back then. There was uh, most deals. Uh, what do we have? Uh, a UX and trade tech, the price reporters would come out with a price once a month. Yeah. Now the marketplace has a price. Uh, we have real time prices. When we when we close a deal, we tell everyone right away what that deal was, so everyone knows what the real time price was. And we have an end of day price. UX has an end of day price. Trade Tech has an end of day price. So what we've done is we've we've commoditized the market, and that's what I would identify the big difference between the 2007 market, the bull market then, and the present bull market. It'll be more controlled. We had gaps up back in 2007 of ten dollars. Uh, $15 a month. And there was no understanding that that was the price. There was no transparency, no liquidity, and there was no management of the process. What companies like what our company does in the introduction of the OTC brokerage model was basically create sensibility, stability in the marketplace by making sure that if somebody's looking for uranium, we up the price a little bit. Uh, we we try to can, uh, try to find a seller, identify where they're willing to sell, find out what their goals are, and see where they're going to be, and try to bring the buyer up to the seller's price, but in a controlled manner. At the same time, introducing other sellers and other buyers. So the fact that we're a lot more commoditized and a lot more liquid and transparent than we once were will help the marketplace go up in a more controlled manner. So no one will be shocked or less shocked at the price and there'll be more control. That's the uh, the difference. Now, a lot of this, what's the same is the fact that the uh, uh, commodity often goes uh, unnoticed. People don't really get involved in uranium when things are are uh, boring, when there's more exciting investments to have. There's tech investments. There's there's uh, other commodities that just happen to be more sexy and more exciting. Uh, uranium gets a bad rap and people ignore it when there's nothing to look at. Uh, so therefore, all of a sudden, it became a really, really interesting commodity back in 2007, uh, only to sell off for a number of reasons with uh, Fukushima, of course, in 2011, and the financial meltdown, which forced selling into the marketplace based on the fact that they were not, that it wasn't that they were not convinced uranium was a good investment, they needed to liquidate all assets. So that hurt the very thin and illiquid market. Here we are again in a more liquid market. Here we are again in, they don't like using the nuclear renaissance uh, term anymore because that didn't work out last time. So we'll call it the nuclear bull market. And we're in the nuclear bull market for all the same reasons. All the environmental groups are behind nuclear because of the uh, no carbon emissions. Uh, it, it is it is a, a true, a reliable form of electricity generation. It's safe. Uh, if you do a look at all the studies and reports, it is more safe than every other possible way of generating electricity. Nuclear is the safest of all. So all the reasons why it's good, all the reasons why it's positive are now being identified and people are now growing comfortable with them. The capital investment in nuclear power plants, in utilities, uh, is high. So therefore, you don't just need the capital markets to look to invest in a, a, in, a, in a nuclear power plant. You have to have governments offer grants and stability. You have to have uh, work together with the private and public sector has to work together in order to uh, advance it. So now we're doing it in a nice organized way. We're doing it it's, we're everywhere. Everybody's behaving properly. Everybody's having the, the, the right meetings and discussions. You go to any of these conferences now, which I go to a lot of them, the optimism's overwhelming. I think one of the biggest problems at one of our last conferences was people can't find a trained personnel to hire uh, to uh, advance the uh, nuclear fleet. So it's all good, but just like it was last time. And I think we'll keep it good this time. Okay. Uh, Joe, what's your take on SMRs? Uh, will they play a big role in the future? Uh, once again, that's a science question. I like what people are saying about it. It makes logical sense. And usually uh, when, when something's presented to me and it makes logical sense, then why wouldn't it work? So I have to think it would work. It makes sense. It's logical. Uh, it's a next progression in the fact that everyone globally is growing more and more comfortable uh, with uh, uh, with nuclear power, and they now have uh, the uh, the smaller reactors uh, targeting more areas without losing energy in the uh, uh, in the transmission of electricity. Uh, it just makes a lot of sense. So hopefully the science. Uh, brings us up to the level where we're protected. It's safe. It's a good form of a uh, of electricity. So I mean, I like it. Sentiment across the board is good. Uh, it, it's hard to find a naysayer. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, Joe, you said that your company is not investing in uranium equities, but I will ask you nevertheless your personal uh, opinion. What do you think about the performance of uranium equities? Uh, will they catch up with the spot price rise or they are not entirely correlated? What well, first of all, well, first of all, yes, that's a, that's a good question. But first of all, I'll, I'll start with uh, all my, my friends on the production side, the ones that have had maintained and held their companies afloat over these tough years when production was uh, much lower than the cost of production. The uranium price was much lower than the cost of production. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy uh, for all those uh, wonderful guys that have, and girls that have held in there and, uh, and went through the storm. Now it seems we're through the storm. And a lot of them are doing well. Some of them uh, obviously are, are, are structured differently than others. I don't do the analytics on the equities because I don't want to tempt myself into breaking my own policy here at Uranium Markets. But I, I love the, the happiness and euphoria of the very, very wonderful people that have spent a lot of their years uh, trying to, if not producing, trying to produce uranium. And I'm so happy for them that they're doing well. Uh, I, I feel for my utility clients and uh, we'll try to help them as best we can to uh, advise them when it's time to step in. If we see uh, supply exceeding demand and we have to advise our utility clients, uh, we'll have to do that. And that's a sad conversation because uh, they, they feel uh, that, that they didn't budget necessarily for the prices we're at right now. But you asked about production. You asked about the equities. And I'm very happy for all our equity friends that they're uh, after weathering a tough storm. They're doing well. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned your clients. Uh, are your clients mostly Western? utilities or you are globally presented uh, uh, present i mean your company do you have uh, mostly canadian american clients or you you have spread it all over the world no we're i will global. not ask any names of course but uh, <laughs> of course i'm curious not. Several of them, of course, had said to say hello to you while I was on the show, but I don't want to say hello for one and not another. So I'll keep, I'll keep that. And you know the ones who they are. But we have ones that you can throw a rock at a couple of times and hit them from my office here. You have some that you'd have to get on an airplane for 20 something hours to visit. So uh, uh, so we are global. Uh, we speak, we make sure we review all the 438 or so nuclear power plants in the world and make sure that we identify who buys for them and somehow either send them our information in a regular correspondence or speak to them regularly. Also, in the production side, we talk to everyone who's uh, producing, exploring, uh, uh, who's regularly producing now, who hopes to produce a year from now, and everybody who wants to participate in the buying and selling of physical uranium, whether as an investor or whether just to take advantage of, of market movement. We have our trader friends uh, who add, wonderfully add to the liquidity of the marketplace. Uh, they take risk and take risk away from the utilities and the producers by participating on a regular basis in the market. They try to buy low, sell high. Sometimes that doesn't work out very well for them. But the, but the good ones and most of them, the ones that last a long time, they uh, they get the buy low, sell high thing down pretty well. They help with, with, uh, uh, with uh, the duration of uh, deliveries. They help the, the trader friends really help with a lot of that stuff. And recently uh, on the production side, certainly were helped tremendously by the hedge funds and the investors who identified the market being too cheap and they feel that they helped the market by helping the price go up. They benefited personally. So they also benefited the uh, production side by having the price of uranium reach a point where more production can come on. And the, the most paramount important thing for the utility is making sure that they don't interrupt their, uh, their fuel supply. Okay, Joe, final question. Uh, on what other commodities uh, Joe Kelly bullish on besides uranium? Uh, well, I'm bullish going forward. I think we uh, had a nice soft landing in the U.S. economy, and I think the global economy is now putting inflation in control. Uh, with inflation in control, I see a growth for the next couple, next foreseeable future. So I'm optimistic on, on just macroly uh, that on everything. I think we're we're going to be good. Uh, I know we have some uh, uh, some turbulent issues uh, as far as political issues globally, uh, which I hope we can manage and and certainly uh, uh, get under control. Uh, but right now, economically, the uh, sti the stimulus, the COVID stimulus, and the inflation to follow, I think has been managed uh, properly, and and uh, and I think we, we're we're bullish going forward. So thank you for that question. That was good. <laughs> uh, okay, that was Joe Kelly. Joe, I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you for coming to my show, and I wish you all the best. Oh, please, thank you. It was a wonderful speaker was speaking to you. You have to come to one of our conferences sometime, and uh, uh, and then visit with the Uranium people because you're a bit of a bit of a known man here in our Uranium world. So you must uh, must come visit. Uh, definitely, I will. Maybe we will have some lunch on WNA in London. 
in September. That will be the first occasion, probably. Thank you Perfect. very much, though.